All right, real lulls is back in your life. None of this <laughs> fake lull stuff here. Uh, today on the show, Brian and myself, we're going to talk a little bit about the recent Billy Walters book. I uh, finished that up the other day. Uh, he was also recently on Joe Rogan. He's had some quotes that have kind of circulated in the sports betting sphere that we'll discuss. Also going to talk about the recent changes or uh, experimentation with no late swap for NBA on DraftKings. And then we'll pick up where Brian and Davis left off kind of predicting 2024 best ball meta conversation. It's lulls with Pete and Brick. Let's do it. I, does he think, I think he thinks go. this, he thinks this is a go. Vegas Dave thinks this is a go. Hot naked girls doing yoga. What? Why don't you just win like a man? Random.org. <laughs> Type in one for yes, two for no, and let the DFS cats pick for you. And I'm absolutely begging you not to do bus. <laughs> Please don't do bus. Right. We are back, Brian, after a, a one week break. I used to, you know, I always like to brag about our consistency here on Lulls. And now I've, you know, missed a couple of episodes to start this new year. That's, yeah, that's the most we've missed in a short period of time ever. I, I actually, I think that the fake Lulls uh, is like a very good, uh, it's a good bit and it's a good programming thing to uh, to fill in the holes. I think you and Davis can do uh, Lulls adjacent things and talk about things that I wouldn't want to talk about and it, it works out great. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It seems people watched it. Uh, got a decent amount of views, so. There you go. There you go. GM to uh, everyone in the chat here today. Uh, also, Brian, we got a little some fresh digs. You, you, people noticed the little borders here, you know, did a little, uh, little housekeeping around here. Fancy. Yeah. Dave, first ever leap day lulls. This this has to be. Um, I mean, the math would, would check out. We have not. We've done hundreds of episodes, but not quite four years worth of episodes. What do you do if you're born today? I think you have to throw a rager because it's like an Olympics level event. Oh yeah, four years. But I mean, like the next year, like when's <laughs> your birthday? I think uh, I was. Re I don't know who I was recently talking to. I don't know if they had a friend who was born, but they were saying that their even their um like driver's license has to show it as March first because like they technically would be wouldn't be of age or whatever to drink and stuff like mm. all those various things you have to actually oh, yeah. be a day late to legally do it uh but yeah i mean it, i think those people probably have fun with it right like it's probably a badge of honor uh you get to go up you know imagine you're in elementary school and your teacher's going up to do the birthdays and you're like well actually <laughs> it's a benton i don't have a birthday but we will be celebrating it and my mom will be bringing in cupcakes all week long my nephew's born on April Fool's Day. Okay, that's, that's a tough a, scene. That's a good one. Is it me or has that? Obviously, we're what uh, about a month away from that. Have we chilled out on April Fools? I, I feel like there was an internet heyday, and it like spanned I don't know like ten years. Where just like Google and everyone would go over the top with it. Every single goddamn newsletter you subscribe to would be a bit. I want to say last year it seemed a little chilled out. Yeah, it definitely from when we were growing up, it's way different because there was no internet. So like people would forget and you could April fools them, you know, really easily in the morning, you know, but now you go online, you're going to, Oh, it's right. It's April fools. I got to be prepared. I got to be ready. I know. Yeah, that is true. Yeah. People are much more, uh, on their guard, uh, these days we're, we're saying worse. Christmas has to be the worst day. Yeah. My brother's birthday is the 28th. And I always felt bad for him because yeah. relatives kind of lumped in like, Hey, here's your Christmas and birthday gift. That's definitely worse. If you're going to be three days, I would rather be three days early. Oh, maybe it, that's kind of rough too, but yeah, At, there's, there's pros and cons to all of them. My mine smack dab in the middle of the summer, June 15th. Uh, everyone write that down. Don't forget. <laughs> Don't worry. I have it on my Twitter bio. So you will remember. Um, I always felt uh, gypped out because my friends got to have their birthday parties at during the school year, right? And like everyone would be dispersed during the summer and like you got all the fanfare during the school year and I never got that. So that was my one gripe with being a summer birthday. The 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 early birthdays are good for like you get your license first, you know, that type, those type of milestones. Yeah. Although I don't think kids care about a lot of that stuff anymore, Pete, or as much. 
like the like people don't get their driver's license the day they turn 16 anymore very you know they don't drink they don't drink as much i know they're they're they've gone woke man i don't know they don't go outside <laughs> <laughs> Then, well, then why would the drinking be correlated? Because drinking when you're a kid is way more of a social event. There's not like de depressed 16 year old drinkers. I, I'm not joking about that. Know. I'm sure there are, but probably because like there's so many different entertainment choices. And yeah. when we were young, it's like there was none. So it's like right. let's go drink. Let's and I feel like uh, do you? I always used to read the trend pieces from like Japan about how all of their young men, you know people were like just not having sex anymore, not going out. And I think they were always like a bit ahead of us with just kind of like the technology, the entertainment stuff. Mm -hmm. And now it seems like that's kind of trickled over into us where it's like, yeah, there's just so much good stuff to do on your computer and TV. Why would you ever leave your house to go play with your friends? Right. Yeah. And you can play, you know, um, make these like pseudo online relationships and use, you you know, talk, talk to people through their headset and stuff. It's true. It's true. Uh, very much yeah. like the pseudo online relationship we have. Kind you of. Won't, you won't leave your house to actually uh, to meet up. <laughs> yeah, I'm I'm criticizing them as I haven't left my house in three years. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh man. Uh, so uh, yeah, I finished the uh, the Billy Walters book uh, this week. I had actually coincidentally uh, picked it for a book club. I've been doing the book club through my newsletter. We got a channel in the Deposit Kingdom Discord where we've been talking about it. And then uh, he was on Rogan, and that was when everyone got the cliff notes uh, to what the book was uh, was about. Did you catch his full uh, Rogan podcast? I did, yeah. Maybe the last 20 minutes I didn't get, but almost the whole thing. Yeah. And what, like, because you're, you're more plugged into golf than me. Like, I had remembered hearing a little bit about the Phil Mickelson stuff, but was, like, that a really big story within the golf world for a while? For a while, and but I didn't know. I didn't know. Well, I think he was insinuating. So um, I guess maybe no one knew, like just casual, you know, fans that that uh, uh, Phil turned fed and turned in one of his buddies, and then turned in Billy Wald. He kind of insinuated he turned him in. I don't know if like he wouldn't testify. So I think he was trying to insinuate that because he didn't testify it was part of the deal Phil made to get out of all of his troubles. Yeah, it, for people who aren't caught up with it, so Phil and Billy Walters became friends. They had a partnership, and Billy Walters was essentially using Phil as a beard. You know, there were books where he could get down max like ten thousand on a spread, and Phil Mickelson's max would be like five hundred thousand on a game. So they're like, "Hey, let's develop this partnership. I'll you know tell you my numbers, my lines. You bet them here." And I guess even immediately it got uh, a little wonky because Phil was then taking that number to bet at other books. And then that would move the line and make things even harder for Billy Walters and kind of his syndicate. And so he immediately had to be like, Phil, like chill out on this. Like if we're going to be partners, like you have to do it at this book. And, you know, Billy is doing it strategically, throwing in like fake bets that make it look like it's Phil's account because Phil, of course, was like a lifetime loser on these sites and didn't want to make it so obvious that he had turned this account around. But anyways, they had a relationship with this stuff. Um, and then he ended up basically getting busted or Billy Walters for an insider trading thing that uh, Phil Mickelson also knew about. But I guess per Billy Walters, they did nothing wrong. He just wanted Phil Mickelson to testify the truth of the, you know, the extent of their relationship. But because Phil Mickelson was tied up in another case where he was, you know, had even more at stake for, for wrongdoing, he didn't want them poking around even further and asking a bunch of questions about that. So he's like, it's just easy if I don't testify and they don't go down this rabbit hole. And if my buddy Billy Walters is a casualty shrug, so be it. Did he in the book and did anyone else catch this? If I got it right, it seemed like in the interview, he never actually said he was innocent. He never said, I did not do this. This whole thing is made up whole cloth. He never like, made that like that's what i would do like my first first sentence would be i'm completely honest that this is total bullshit now let me explain why he didn't do he like laid it out piece by piece that there was no evidence 
and yes. he was railroaded and and they in the the fact that he was a popular gambler made it good for the prosecutor th- which i'm sure it was all true but he never actually said he was innocent you're right i i noticed that too and like the one thing he would use as his defense he would say like you know so he insider trading selling uh a stock early and he was saying hey i've been buying the same stock for 10 years and i only sold a fraction of it if i actually had inside information wouldn't i have dumped my entire position that was kind of his defense but now that you say that he did kind of always dance around that and just be like they never had any proof or you know i would have done this if i i actually had the information which does seem a little strategic because even reading the book, I came away from it and I haven't done it yet, but like wanting to read more about the case to see kind of what the other side of the story was, because it sounds like two things can be true. Like Bill Mickelson can like be a dirt bag and Billy Walters could be guilty and it not all add up in, in one clean way. Right. And just, I mean, I just, I don't know. I'm like, I, I just feel like the majority of innocent people, their first statement would be, I will, I did not, did not do this. Like I didn't, I didn't receive, he never mentioned anything and uh, he didn't, he didn't do it that way. He like laid it out where you're supposed to insinuate that he's innocent. I don't know. I thought that was a little strange. It sucks with Phil too. Cause I like Phil a lot. I think he's funny. Yeah. And, and, and I am, I'm guessing with him, it's, he's just dumb like a dumb gambler and addicted to gambling and like made mistakes that way. But then he, you know, he turned, he turned on people so he wouldn't go to jail. It's interesting too, just the whole, the whole way the fed, like the feds work is really gross, you know, like just getting people to turn and then finding the mark that makes their career look the best. So like taking down Phil Mickelson, you know, obviously he, the person thought like, Oh man, that might make me like millions of people might hate me. But if I take down this gambler guy and I know people don't like gambling, so I'll do him and he's really popular. So we'll just, we'll work. Yeah. Here. And that is a theme throughout his life in the book is like, he was used as a proxy for the dark seedy side of gambling because he's been doing this for so long. I mean, I think he had been indicted. It ended up being five or six total times. Um, and a lot of the initial ones too, it was because like he was running Uh, a very sophisticated for the time sports betting syndicate. And because the feds were such idiots, they just assumed he was like match fixing or bookmaking or doing something illegal. And they're trying to get to the bottom and they're like, he's, he's got guys calling in bets and having all these runners. It's like, no, he's just running a syndicate, but it's the same thing we talk about with like, if you go to testify about crypto or legislation, right? Like no one even is going to know what the fuck you're talking about. These feds didn't even understand what a sports betting syndicate was and how it could be on the up and up relative to what the laws of sports betting were at the time. Yes. And, and how, how about how rich too, man? Like they find him 50 million or something like that. Um, and it's just, he could just pay that, you know, <laughs> he must, he must have half a billion or something. I don't know. Yeah. I mean, I, I wonder how much has been siphoned off by the legal system over the years with all of his, he even right. said when he got out of prison, like he sued everyone <laughs> in the book that was associated with that case. Right. Um, and he does a ton of, uh, you know, philanthropy stuff too, as well. So yeah, yeah he's got to be pretty, pretty loaded. But I think the reason too, I'm kind of like, even if that specific instance, like his entire MO every lot as like, um, as an edge seeker and a gambler, it was like, he was going to find whatever an edge was and press it, press it, try to walk up to the line of legality, yeah, maybe step over it, but not like burst through it. And so it wouldn't be insane if when he started to get into stock trading, he applied the same kind of principles that made him such a good sports better that right. made him such a good pool player all of those little things i mean he's telling his golf stories and they're all talking about you know he had to learn how to play golf without greasing up his club faces so i don't know if he he mentioned this one on rogan but in the book it was like just known that all of these guys grease their club faces when they played because it helped uh eliminate a slice and then he had to play on the up and up and basically had to rebuild his swing uh, and get lessons because he didn't have the grease to to help him out anymore. No, I don't remember that on the show. That's interesting. Yeah. The, I mean, the the whole we've talked about on the show, like that that the moral justification for that professional sports better is questionable. I and I still haven't heard anyone give a good explanation on the morality of it. 
besides mine, uh, which which could I could see people don't even agree with my my argument for, you know, like if a customer, you know, they 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 want they don't you know like if you if, I'm I'm trying to think of an example of real life, but like if a business doesn't want you as a customer, like it's not like super moral to then hire Phil Mickelson to you know place the bets for you um, right there's 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 some like it's you know like hey it's we're working together so what's wrong with it i guess kind of morally but most of the accounts they get like thousands of like you know dormant accounts that people wouldn't have bet and then just make smaller bets you know most of these sports betting syndicates so like you know that 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 kind of dovetails into like peer to peer betting too that I wanted to talk about, but I still want to talk about, you know, this, this Walter's book, but really, really quickly, I don't think the peer to peer betting uh, is this, this like utopian solution that a lot of people think. I mean, I still would want peer to peer betting sites to happen and get, you know, large because you could use them for liquidity and, you know, why not? But like the reason you could beat, most people can beat sports books is because they make so many shitty lines. Like they, they yeah. make, Tons of prop lines and stuff. And I think he might talk about that and might have talked about this on Rogan too, where, you know, we can beat, you know, prop, some prop, some prop lines because they're so far off and the market's so small and a peer to peer network. That's not going to happen. You're going to have like Spanky and Rufus and Billy Walters and like the, the market leaders setting the market and you're just going to be betting into them and they're not going to be putting up a bunch of dumb lines that they don't know that they have an edge on. So yeah. like, the idea that you're just playing against Joe Schmo across the street in a peer to peer, you know, low vig, no vig environment is not going to be the way it shakes out. So, um, no. So like, I, I mean, I, I'm still, you know, obviously I hope they, somebody does that, but like, I don't think it's going to be like a solution at all. Um, no, not this iteration of peer to peer betting. It's going to have to be like the, you know, the sports betting championships style of peer to peer betting where right. you need to play. Rules against, are different. Yeah. It needs to be more DFS or something. Yeah. Um, unless somehow the, the, the person who, who, who makes the site can, can, can like make sure that like the, the, the same thing they do in DFS where they, they siphon off or they car, car, uh, compartmentalize the uh, the level play, you know, like if you haven't played much, you could play it. You could play these levels. If you play a lot, you can only play those levels. Yeah. But like the liquidity is a big issue on sports betting. So like they need, they need Spanky and Rufus and Billy Walters or whoever will put, you know, millions of dollars so that like regular, regular Joe's can bet. But like, I, I don't know. I see it on Twitter. People are like, Oh, I can't, this will all be fine. Once there's peer to peer betting, even if that happens, which is a big F. Um, I don't know. I, it sounded like points bet the site just consolidated or got bought off by another sports book and like doubled their VIG today or yesterday. I really? saw it on Twitter. I don't know if that's true, but I saw it on Twitter, so it has to be true. So, um, you know, that that sort of you know partnership with the state where eventually the boys are going to get too high and these a lot of these sports books are going to go under which I think increases the justification for, for syndicate betting, by the way. So like, you know, like if they weren't so heavily um, moted off by regulation, you know, they wouldn't, there'd be peer to peer betting already. There'd be, you could bet on pinnacle and bet Chris and you, there'd probably be a thousand books you could choose from. I, is the, is the FTC ever, you know, I, I've, there's been a few of those like high profile uh, mergers going on that they've they're set to block i think the one right now is the big grocery store one like the kroger's albertson mm -hmm. one like it, it, would the would the ftc ever have to look at like a uh uh like a monopoly within the sports betting uh space if like like say if like mgm and like DraftKings like met up where you're mentioning like these the big immediate immediately jumps like it doesn't seem like that is too far-fetched you could be right. I'm just like, I'm just so cynical about it all that it's, it's really just whatever they want they'll do yeah. because the lottery's a monopoly and they run that wholly by themselves, you know, like the state, the, the scratch off tickets, you know, and the, like, you know, around here, I don't know if they have in Boston, but they have the, the local slot machines, you know, that like are at yeah. bars and stuff. Now they're legal. Yeah, yeah. So like the worst unbeatable forms of gambling 
the state runs as a monopoly. So, yeah. like, you know, what justification do they have for saying that sports books shouldn't be a monopoly, you know? But they will. They'll do whatever the fuck they want. <laughs> they can. Yes. And they, if, it, if it suits them, they will. But, the, but like, the, the gambling industry is has lobbied and worked with the state for so long that that union is also something that would be hard to break to break because you know they've they've worked so long it's they get a lot of tax dollars from them so it's really more of a, a state a, a state uh private partnership yeah so like i mean i i hear you like should they eventually look at that probably <laughs> But yeah, like will it on their priority list, like people getting gouged for bread and milk is not going to be up there versus someone having to pay like minus one forty for their bets instead of minus one ten. It's yeah, I know. It, it, but like <laughs> you think about like the priority though isn't like the moral priority that you and me have, right? right. It's it's for their you know what incentives is it for right. for them to to make to pull the trigger? I always think that's the more interesting question on like. Billy Walters, you know, you know, any, any like big name, not what they did, but why are they getting them this time? Is right. really the interesting, cause they're all doing something illegal. <laughs> you know what I yeah. mean? Like they, I'm sure they can catch a lot of these guys, but like, you know, the, like, why are they doing it now? And like, I think the old school way is just like, Oh, they just found the evidence and they're just taking it where it leads them. I don't fucking buy that. You know, I think there's a lot of agendas yeah. going on. And speaking of like agendas, like one of the things that's mentioned in the book, like multiple times when he was arrested, like his lawyer and his team, like was trying to get out ahead of it and say, let us turn ourselves in, you know, peacefully, whatever, like, but they specifically wanted to make a show out of it, these feds. Yeah. And one time they even in, I, it was one of like the third or the fourth times they like picked him up and he's like, Oh, I'm getting, you know, driven, uh, to the, to the courthouse or whatever. And they take him to uh, a hotel because they needed a one day delay for him to stage the press conference to announce that they were arresting Billy Walters. And that same whole dynamic, they were like, this isn't, this isn't about, you know, just putting a bad guy behind bars. This is about politics. It's about agendas. It's making a show of it. It's about yeah. spinning a narrative to the public. Right. It's for sure. They have to, they have to justify their relevance, not just the FBI, but like the whole FCC and, you know, regulatory apparatus. So like someone needs to be sacrificed on the altar, you know, yeah. every whatever, even though I'm sure they could do it every day, every second. Yeah, <laughs> probably. And, and, and also they're not the, you know, they're, they're, um, you know, just like Billy said in the Rogan interview, the, there's way more shenanigans going on in the real stock market, you know, compared to sports betting. Yeah. Right. But like, of course people think the stock market's much more legitimate and it's weird. At the same time, they, you know, they think it's more legitimate, but I bet if you polled everyone, they, how much shenanigans is going on in the stock market? I bet like 80% of the country would go like, Oh, there's shenanigans. Right. And that, that was another thing. He, he mentioned his 60 minutes interview on Rogan. I don't think he got into in, in the book. He said he regretted it at the end of his 60 minutes interview. He basically said that things like I've encountered all kinds of gamblers, lots of shady people over my years, but nothing's more shady than what goes on in the stock market or whatever. And that ended up it, he basically drew the line or inferred that that got the feds on him even more. Like that quote, like, oh, you are, you know, coming and saying that this isn't real and on the up and up, and this is going to make us put you under our magnifying glass even more. And he said he wished he could take that line back at the very end of the I minutes interview. Yeah. Yeah. Being a public figure can have, have its uh, downfalls, Pete, which, which uh, maybe, maybe uh, even, you know, some, you know, like even a small time as, uh, as, as we are, um, I, you know, the, uh, the, 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 I think the whole, the whole, the whole, um, security state needs a big, a big change. I mean, I know when I worked at the Capitol, like they had even control there at state capitals because what they, what they do is they get, they get someone busted for something minor and then they flip them and then they'll put a, a, a wire on them. And then that from there, they'll, they'll get somebody else and then they'll get somebody else. And then now they're, they're they're heavily uh, influencing your state capital. 
Um, and now I'm probably going to get uh, the feds knocking on my door, but <sighs> well, that he, I mean, the amount, uh, it, you know, to bring it back to Billy Walters, the amount of time, you know, in the book that his wires were tapped. I mean, this is like his entire life was tapped for these like large swaths. It was like a six months, like every single thing yeah. he did was being recorded and monitored. It's just like a, a crazy way to live. And I, I do think Walters is interesting in how he was such a good and, and likable person that his network extended like far and wide, you know, and he, he would play the game too. Like he, he said, I think on Rogan and he also said in the book, like he donated to like basically every Nevada governor to multiple politicians. Like he knew the people's wheels he needed to grease to like get the things done that he wanted to. And that's why he was friends with politicians, with businessmen, with gamblers, with professional sports players. Like he, because all of those relationships, like, you know, were a means to an end for something he was doing in one way or another. Yes. And, you know, like having all those connections and all, you know, all that history, I would say I would, I didn't read the book. Maybe you could tell me what, what in the book, in the Rogan interview, there was like really no juicy tips. There was no, there was actually a lot of like ABC stuff that I thought he got wrong. Like, cause he, like one thing he told Joe, like, what does a book sports book want to do? Oh, they want action on both sides. And then they collect the VIG like that. He knows that's not how like 95% of these books work. I, 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 I heard that too. And I saw people talking about it, but there were also a couple points in his conversation where he started to talk you know, like inside baseball sports betting terms, like lay the numbers or whatever. It, you could just feel Joe's like eyes glossing over, like you're glazing over, like he didn't know what he was talking about. So I do think he was really trying to dumb things down yeah. for him. But that was an interesting thing to say, because I don't think you necessarily need to eat, eat it, even needed to say that for Rogan's sake. Yeah, that that's fair enough. Yeah, he's just like, I know I'm talking to a broad audience here. What, how do they yeah. think sports books work? They think this. They think that they bet on both sides and just just collect a vig. So you know, fair enough. Uh, I mean, it does make it a lot harder now when you're talking to normal people and you're she's like, actually, that's not how a sports book works. Oh, you know more than Billy Walters. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. I mean, even like I, I was writing the fantasy life newsletter today and I was writing about how all the, the markets moved on Justin Fields potentially going to Atlanta and it like moves to minus 250. And I even I always drop in what the implied probability is in parentheses because I'm not taking for granted like a, a large audience knowing what minus 250 means. Like we generally know I'm going to be like, no, that says it's a little over a 70 percent probability that he, that's at least a statement that most people understand. But there's so many things I think in gambling that just because we are so surrounded by it that we take for granted. It's like I, I go yes. ask probably anyone in your walk of life what minus 250 means. The fuck if they know that. Right. If we did a normal podcast like something like you went on someone, you know, whatever. Someone's show. I, I don't. I, I can't even think of a show right now. But they like you couldn't talk like we talk the jargon and the um, initialisms and acronyms and stuff like that. You'd have to like stop every five seconds. And explain. why do you think I can't grow on YouTube? Because it's impenetrable for anyone coming in out of nowhere. Probably. <laughs> Probably. Yeah. Like what the fuck did they just say? Ah, it's too hard. Um. Did anything else? You know, jump out to you? I mean, like the one of the things that's honestly the impressive thing to me about billy walters and i think i'm going to write about this for my newsletter tomorrow is like there are two things that really make him special i think as like a, a sports better and it's not that he's some brilliant you know genius like he outsourced that to the to the mathematicians and the guys building the models it was like one like his like ingenuity and like craftiness like he was just willing to kind of go like peek under every rock that other people weren't willing to go peek under and then two, just like his flat out doggedness, like that dude would not be told no, like whatever roadblock you put in front of him, he was going to keep going further. I mean, it blew my mind that anecdote. And he mentioned it on Rogan too, that he would send a team and had, he had connections at the Las Vegas airport where he would let his team sweep the planes after the flights landed to pick up the newspapers that people were reading from various cities. So he could scour them for local beat report nuggets on specific teams because there was no internet there was no you know aggregation of this kind of information and he was or he would call someone up in another city and say hey put the phone against the local radio and let me listen to these guys just scouring for information that no one else would have that's interesting another thing that stuck out to me is he 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 has a model he makes lines 
Yeah. And he hires and he hired, he said like over 50 handicappers or something like that. Yep. So he, so he like, I, I always thought he was more like you were talking about getting every little edge inside info. You know, the, he knows the guy's wife is leaving him type of thing. Uh, yeah. But he just does. It sounds like he does a little bit of everything, but with, yeah. but also without giving any good info away, which is probably a good thing. If you, you don't want to do it on the biggest podcast in the world. Cause then everyone knows it. Yeah. Um, th- was there anything in the book? I know he said he's got, he put some matrixes in there, like on how much, um, you know, points are worth and stuff. It'd be good to like put those somewhere, like maybe on the discord. Yeah. For people to use. Yeah. I could, I could pull those. Yeah. It, all of it was, um, it, it was cool to see him kind of outline his process and it made sense. Like the, the stuff where he talked about how his team would quantify stuff, um, with injuries and stuff. And basically they're using all of those assigning a numerical value to all of those soft factors, you know, what is the, the conditions. And they even had a numerical input for like narrative stuff. Like, you know, are these two guys, you know, getting blown up in the media and they're playing with a chip on their shoulder. Like they would try to quantify every single little thing in a smart way. You know, it would have lesser weight than something like a major injury, but it was cool to think through how they, you know, applied it to just their standard power rankings for who these teams are. And then it seemed like their special sauce was then further applying all of those kind of like soft science type things into their personal like line origination stuff. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It was, it it was, um, it was pretty entertaining. Uh, I don't know if I'm going to get the book now because like that podcast was so long. I feel like I read it. He, yeah, the book is really funny. Like when you pull back and you think about its structure, it's like super disjointed. You know, the first, you know, third or first half of it is just like his backstory and some of the stories of him growing up playing pool, like him basically winning money, burning it the next day. He had a, a severe problem with alcohol too. It was like, there were some really sad parts too about how he burned relationships and kind of his relationship with his family as he was trying to do all of this stuff. Um, but then like, you know, you start moving along and then out of nowhere, he's like, all right, here's my master class on sports betting for two chapters. And then he'd be like, oh, and here's my beef with Phil Mickelson. Um, and then, and then he's like, oh yeah. And I went to prison. So I'll tell you these stories at the end too. And oh, by the way, I do a bunch of philanthropy. Let me shoehorn in a couple chapters on this, where it was like the first story, it was like a, just a very normal biography. It had like a very you know, predictable cadence. And then he's like, let me just throw all this stuff in here randomly that I want to get out in this book. Yeah. The, 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 the gambling addiction too, is another thing I I wanted to mention. I thought was interesting. So he said on the pod that he thinks he had a sports betting gambling addiction. And you mentioned the alcoholism too. He did. I think he did mention it. So like he very well could, you know, obviously have a, a gambling addiction. What do I know? But I just think it's, it is kind of strange that like, if you, if you take, the process and apply it to anything else like guitar or something, you know, like what, what did he do? Oh, he was just obsessed with guitar and he just, he couldn't stop playing it. And he looked at every single angle and then he eventually got awesome. Wow. He was a, a, a addicted to guitar. It's like, no, well, he was just obsessed. I think he, what he, he, I would say he was obsessed with sports betting. I think you could say he was addicted to gambling because a lot of his early stories and he eventually stopped, but he would just go blow it playing blackjack and craps. Like that was his thing. Like he would make all this money even back when he was, um, you know, flipping cars or whatever. And he, you know, uh, went on a trip to, to Vegas with his wife and like the very first night he went down like she was getting ready uh, i believe to like go out and he went down and blew their entire budget for the trip like just playing blackjack and he had just all of these stories of you know he's a hustler makes all this money blow it playing craps blow it you know playing blackjack so i think he was more saying he was addicted to gambling but i would say he was just more obsessed with with sports betting okay i mean you're probably all right but i'm pretty sure he specifically said he was addicted to sports betting okay. and so and maybe he was losing in the beginning too um, and like I said, he probably was, um, a gamble holic, you know, and, and has other addictive, uh, problems with his, but like, there's a fine line between obsession and addiction, in my opinion. And yeah. we're just so programmed that if it happens in, you know, gambling, even if it's poker or DFS or sk- a skill one sports betting, blackjack, you know, 
then you're a gambling addicted person, you know, you're addicted yeah. to gambling. But if it happened, you know, in, in something else that people don't have that mindset, they just go, Oh, he's just, they, they probably don't even think they're obsessed. They just think they're naturally gifted. They didn't yeah. see the times, you know, they didn't go out and they just sat there and practiced for hours. Yeah. And the, the thing that I think made him just slightly different is he always still, um, I guess it was, it was almost like tied to alcohol when his addiction, like that was when he would just go punt it off, right? Like playing crafts, whatever. But like every other kind of gambling endeavor he did while sober, like he wanted an edge associated with it. There's one of the most interesting parts of the book is when he got into trying to do advantage roulette play. And he like bought his own roulette thing, took it apart at home, seeing if he could find any biases in the machine, then was starting to manually record you know, hunt thousands and thousands of spins at a casino, finding the roulettes with biases, then he would get busted doing it. And so then he would essentially have roulette beards who would go out and play these for him. Uh, and so it's like everything he did, he's just like, I am going to find that edge and work tirelessly to exploit it until someone kicks me out, essentially. It, it is impressive just the amount of money-making schemes that worked for him too. <laughs> yeah. Most people, they only don't, they don't, they don't get like six or seven different chances to make a whole bunch of money and lose it and make it. It's nuts. And then when he got older and he had money, then he would, he almost liked taking on like seemingly, you know, impossible projects. He would, there was some cool stories about how he would go buy all these distressed um, like golf courses and, you know, failed country club type stuff. And then, you know, he'd bring in people to essentially rehab them. And he's like, you know, holding town hall meetings with the country club members and saying, we're going to turn things around. And he just, he just had this incredible willingness to tackle very hard problems um, and just stop at nothing uh, until he succeeded. And again, like this is his version of the events. You don't know what kind of stuff he was having to do to, to succeed or get these things through. But I don't think anyone can argue with his perseverance uh, through all of these things. Do you, he, he mentioned Billy Baxter was his best friend too on the podcast. And do you remember Billy Baxter? The, he was in the earlier kind of earlier days of ESPN poker. No, I'm just, I Googled them. Like, obviously I know that, you know, the, the Doyles, the Chip Reese's, uh, but was a, I wasn't was around that kind of group kind of. Okay. Yeah. And uh, I thought he was dead, but I just Googled him. He's still alive. 84 years old. Yeah. What and did he that, say about Billy Baxter? The, he told a story about uh, one of his fighters because they, they would oh, have yeah. boxers and he was, and his fighter was getting crushed. And even though he had, uh, he had bet his own fighter in the crowd, he took all the bets and he was getting his ass beat and his wife says, go throw in the towel. So he went up there and, try to get yeah. Baxter because the Baxter was the cut man or something. And he yeah. goes, throw in the towel. He goes, okay. He goes, I also need 50 grand. Yeah. <laughs> it's the pay off of that. He goes, let's let him fight a little longer. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Now that you tell me that. <laughs> that uh, he, and he actually fought to a draw. That was a, that was a good one. I, I also was laughing on the Rogan interview where they had like a five minute aside trying to figure out if Pete Rose had ever bet against his own team. And Joe's producer is like trying to Google. I was like, come on guys, let's just, let's keep this podcast moving along. Right. Right. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, I would, I, I feel like if, if you, you know, I, I would recommend the book. I just wouldn't feel like you need to be a completist about it. Um, I would read, uh, I, I think you could kind of cherry pick your portions because there's yeah. some really fun stuff, but you don't have to go cover to cover on it. Yeah, I might cherry. I, I was going to cherry pick the sports betting s sections, but he said so little on the interview that I'm like, eh, this probably is not going to tell me tell me anything. Yeah, I think you would. I think you would enjoy it. Um, those those two chapters on he has like his his master class that that he calls it the very beginning of it is very rudimentary beginner stuff, but then it right. gets into some of the interesting stuff. And he also has some kind of fun examples of like, you know, he basically had his own kind of Kelly criterion of like when he was going to ratchet up his bets and use some examples of, you know, the super bowl. He talked about that, uh, that Colt saints one where his line was so different from the, the posted lines. And yeah, I, I think it, I think knowing the stuff you're you're into and the stuff you do, I think it'd be worth it. All right. Um, he also got lucky with Rogan coming back to um, non-exclusive on Spotify. He probably got yeah. like 20 more million views than he would yeah. have. 
it, it's cool too that uh, I I didn't know until the Rogan interview that all of the uh, the the money from his book he was uh, donating to charity. You know, when you read the charity stuff, like at the end of a book about someone who's you know been in prison and been indicted, you you wonder how much of this is just trying to you know soften up the uh, the stuff. But I think in hearing him talk, reading about him more, he does seem like a a truly charitable guy who has had a lot of time to reflect on what you know, provides meaning to his life in a way that it, it didn't feel like hollow or, or phony to me. Yeah. Yeah. This is a brief aside, but like an old man like that going to prison is so stupid. Like just have him wear an ankle monitor for a few, for whatever it was three years. And so we don't have to pay a hundred thousand dollars a year to house this completely harmless old man, you know? And that's what essentially what he, he thought he was doing, like going to that Pensacola prison that was supposed to be a glorified country club. You know, it's supposed to be where the, the Martha Stewart's of the world go. And then he said, like, the conditions were as, you know, awful as you could imagine uh, as far as, you know, the food and the, the health care, which when you're at 70 years old, I mean, the health care, man, that's life and death. Like you get pneumonia or you get like a, a, a simple, basic ailment at that age and you don't have the right medicine or care like that could just be GG curtains for you. Oh yeah. Yeah. It's, it's ridiculous. And is like, what, what's the point? Like just be a little vindictive and make them hurt a little bit. Like, is there really someone who's about to inside trade right now? Who's, you know, Oh no, but Billy Walters, I can't do it. Yeah. Ridiculous. Yeah. It's stupid. Um, so that's the, uh, the TLDR. I'm going to write a little bit about it, uh, in my newsletter tomorrow, the PO box newsletter. And we got the, um, the channel in deposit kingdom discord book cup channel, Billy Walter's book didn't get as much uh, much love as the uh, the non or the fiction stuff we've been reading, but uh, happy to continue talking about the book if any of you guys uh, had any other interesting thoughts about it. But Brian wanted to touch on some DraftKings changes in the NBA DFS streets. Is this a uh, move to eliminating late swap? Is is this an experimental thing, or are they committing to this right now? Well, they've been doing. A couple changes too, Pete. They they I don't know if you noticed they did the low buy-in. They've been doing it more four dollars lately, and it's normally fifteen. Okay. And they dropped it to four, which is much more you know, doable for lots of people. Mm. Um, but it also a lot harder to win, right? Because now you're playing against a hundred thousand guys instead of thirty-five thousand guys. Um, but you know, at a significantly reduced risk percentage of your bankroll. So um uh, I, I, I like that change. I like that they're trying things. I think they were having some overlay issues from uh, some of the comments or some of the um, texts I've had with like my rep and stuff. So they were trying new things. And it, uh, funny enough, with the same rep, he told me uh, specifically when I asked that they will not be doing no late swap this year. <laughs> well, it turns out he was wrong. They're, they're trying tonight with uh, bringing back the old NBA late swap. And for people who don't know, late swap is where you could sw swap off of players after the first game is played. And in no late swap, once the first game starts, you can't change any of your players, even if someone gets hurt or ruled out. Um, and that happens quite frequently in the NBA. And so they've kind of vacillated between uh, no late swap and late swap on both sites over the years, mainly – keeping it with um, uh, uh, with late swap as an option. And I'll say the third thing that they did was they they shortened the slates this year. Not on all of them, but some of them, instead of doing, you know, the 6 o'clock games to the 9 o'clock games, they'll do like the first six. So you don't have to sit there all night. So they made a bunch of changes this year. It, it, but with the, the new late swap stuff, is that in addition to the shortened slates, or are they now extending the slates with no late swap? Um, that's a good question. Let me look right now. It is, I have to see what it's, they have the games up until eight, but I don't know if there's, yeah, actually. So it is, it's no, it's short slate, no late swap. Good call, Pete. I didn't even look at that. Because I thought that would have been the, the, the reason for the short slates was to try to mitigate some of the late scratches or that late news people wouldn't have access to. So then you, wouldn't you assume if you had no late swap that you would then just have the full slate? Well, hold on. Let me, let me make sure. Um, yeah, no. There's two games at. There's a game at nine, nine and nine thirty that aren't on the main slate. Hmm. So it's no late swap and short slate, which is, still makes a lot of sense because you're gonna have more info with these earlier games, 
and you definitely won't have any info on the later games usually. Um, and also there's less chances of a scratch this, the less amount of games you have, which this is probably what's going to happen tonight, right? Is It's got to, right? So let's see who's playing. Who's the biggest name? Luka Doncic, right? Luka's going to get scratched. Something like that. Who else? Steph Curry. <laughs> it, it is funny to think about, like, who is the person in 2024, the year of our Lord, that is going to – be such a casual that they're complaining about a guy getting late scratch. Like how have they, I guess I'm trying to think who is this person that survived in this ecosystem? Uh, it has played for so long that is still so ignorant to like the mechanics and why late swap is such an advantage to the sharps who are at their computer. Like who is the person pushing back on this uh, now? That's, that's a casual player. Like are there even new NBA casual players in the DFS pool? I still, I don't know if there's new ones, but they will they will push back. I guarantee because you see yeah. it with the sports betting, Pete, right? With the yeah. guys, the guy gets hurt. DraftKings refund all my bets since 1976 because this guy got hurt. Like it, there's just they have to just ignore it. I mean, or what? I mean, give them refunds or whatever, but just like, like ignore the dummies. Um, if you, I mean, if they want to go this route, I think another reason they did it tonight, Pete, is it's a weekend. That's my guess is that they just want to do it like Friday, Saturday, so people can go out and still play DFS and not worry about their lineups since it's Friday, Saturday. Yeah. And I, I imagine the average age is 30 something, right? Of the average DFS player who still goes out. You would think. Yeah. Because those DFS guys, they're men about town, men about town, Pete. <laughs> what a, I, I forget. Like, have you, you, you were out on NBA DFS or have you been playing? No, I've been playing. And are you are you excited about this change? Um, I don't know. I'm, I'm I I don't know if I like the idea of it's a different thing every night. Basically, you know, if they're gonna do like if they do Friday nights is no late swap just from here out on out. I think I think that's fine. But if as, they're going to be Neil like, does point out tonight, today is Thursday. You know that, right? Oh my God. Oh, so, <laughs> oh, so it is no late swap tonight. Is it? I, yeah. I don't know why I thought it was Friday. <laughs> so, t so it starts tomorrow. So I don't okay. know if it's the full, the full slate is. Uh, yeah. Maybe it's, maybe it's up. No, nah, it's not up yet. Oh yeah, it is. No. Fr so it is Friday. No late swap is uh short slate as well. Okay. Here's another thing. It's six to seven. So it's just um, an hour's worth of news. So there's no late games on it. Um, so there's a chance you have a decent amount of the info even before the lock for those, those early games. Mm -hmm. Shady advice in the chat. This is less about the casuals and more about bringing back some of the regs who have tapped out a bit this year due to families and such. He references uh, Petty Whistle's. Hoop. I mean, th they're playing still. Are they? I mean, maybe not hoop, but Whistles definitely played last night. I'm pretty sure. If Petty's not playing NBA, what is he doing? He has to be playing. Um, let me look. Let me look. What day is? I don't know what day it is. So, apparently. <laughs> well, well, that was kind of what I was asking last time we talked about it. Is like, who who is the straw that is stirring the drink on these decisions? Is it the high volume whales that are you know? playing a ton of volume or is it the vocal you know minority of casuals who are pissed when their guy gets scratched and they can't do anything about it i'm sorry i'm uh whistles play yesterday but petty didn't shady says pet is uh coaching uh basketball these days no shit how did i not notice that there you go this, this is you know this is how you can tell i've been losing Cause like I, when I start losing, I'm like, fuck it. I just close and don't even look, you know, <laughs> so I don't know who won. If I'm doing well, I'll be like, Oh God. Oh, this guy's really good too. Cause he's up there with me. But, um, but that, so isn't it just this, is it the same pendulum swinging back and forth where it's like, you know, the, the high volume players want this. So, okay, we'll give you no late swap. And then if you know enough of the casual start complaining that they're pissed off about their user experience, then they'll get rid of it and it'll just swing back and forth. Now the high volume guys are like, no, we're sitting out again. Yeah, maybe. And they'll go back and forth. Uh, 
I don't know. What do you think they're going to do, Shady? Do you think they're going to just continue? I mean, I, my guess is for us this year, we're going to do short slates and Friday night late, no late swap. That's my guess. How are the prize pools for? Are, are they are they much smaller with the shorter slates? Or are they fairly comparable? Uh, they're the same. Yeah, I I do. This is a really good point by Mookie that it would be kind of the best of both worlds. He says, I don't see why they wouldn't implement an underdog esque system of late swap and only let you swap off the guys who get scratched as opposed to being able to fully rebuild with the knowledge of what's happened. I agree. I agree. You know, like the, the, especially in, um, UFC and PGA, well, PGA mainly. PGA just seems so obvious that there should be some backup system where yeah. if your guy after lock gets sick, you get to switch off of him. Although last week it didn't, it didn't matter. Chris got her up, who was in my, of course, my best lineup got sick the day after and then withdrew. And you, and you could do it just like underdog does it where it's, you know, if you don't touch anything, they're just going to put the highest available ADP player from your draft into your lineup. If you set your manual ranks or tweak it, you can kind of choose theoretically which guy that wasn't drafted that you want to be placed. Same with DraftKings, right? They could just say, Hey, if you don't touch it, we'll put in the next highest remaining salary of a player yet to go. And if you want to adjust your ranks or however they would have it set, like you have your alternate player, yeah. or maybe you can go and resubmit then you can pick a guy who's $2,000 less salary if you feel like it. Yes, and that's better when you take in an, into account instead of opening up the the opening up the team for you because then you could do like late swap strategies that other other competitors in your GPV can't. So yeah. like if Pete's guys get ruled out, let's say he's got 35% LeBron, now he gets to change, you know, whatever that is, 60, you know, 60 lineups or whatever. Uh all while using these late swap sim tools while the rest of us who don't have any LeBron are screwed, especially the casual guys making right. one, two, three lineups and have zero LeBron. Um, you know, the, I mean, the, and, and that is, I think the main, I wonder if the sim, all the sim talk and sim products are like made their way up to the, to the, uh, the to the brass at DK. And they're like, well, how can we stop that? Let's, let's get rid of this late swap so that people can't utilize it. Cause that's really the main, if no one, if, if it was more like baseball, although that might change this year and no one was using late swap to adjust for the field and they were more so using late swap to adjust for news and scratches and lineup changes, like who cares? Right. You know, that's not a huge thing. Um, you know, NBA is a little different because there's a lot more scratches on, on, on the rug than there is an MLB, but it, the 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 real concern is you know the casuals for if I would imagine from their point of view the casuals are never adjusting for field differences where the pros they're just doing that after every game. Yep. Yeah. Um, the yeah I was listening to um, uh, Neil on his new podcast playing for keeps. By the way, uh, if you guys like Lulz and if you like Neil, you'll like that show. He had um, uh, shit my money on uh, his most recent one and talking about too, like for people who have a defined system for a certain set, whether that includes late swap or not like this, you know, herky jerky stuff, you know, even shady mentioning in the chat, like they're going to run some stuff in parallel, but who knows what they actually end up doing. Like for you guys who are investing time into sophisticated processes for these games, like these shifts have big ramifications for like your process or what you're doing and to not necessarily know like that makes it hard. Like you've talked about this before. Hey, if I knew hockey slates were going to have X amount of prize pools or whatever, like I would devote time into building out my process and play that for the season. But like, what incentive do you have to be like, okay, I'm going to build out this whole thing for no late swap. Maybe it's easier to do without it, whatever. But still, like if they then just change it back in two weeks and you're like, fuck, I spent all this time overhauling my process. Yes. The, I think that the, the, the reason it's fine now is because there's also – a no late swap strategy that you can implement in NBA with all the cues. Um, yeah. It's more volatile, but like we've had experience, right? We know how to handle it. So I, I mean, I'm just going to do what I did before. <laughs> so yeah, if they did va vacillate between the two of them, I think at this point it's fine for, I mean, if you're talking just about the guys who have been playing for a decade, you know, 
Um, but yeah, regular people who aren't who are only used to one style or pros who are only used to one one style, now they have to come up with some new new strategies. Or just don't yeah. play Fridays, I guess. Yeah. Or Thursdays that you think are Fridays. Yeah, uh, who knows what day it is. <laughs> how how is your what what other DFS stuff are you playing right now? Are you doing MMA, golf? P PGA, yeah, PGA. I had to, my fucking PGA is the worst. I don't even know why I play it anymore. The uh, two weeks ago, I don't know if you saw Spieth got got uh, the band. Yeah. Hammer. He was in my best lineup in the high stakes one, and then last week, got her up was in my best. You let Jason do all the tilting publicly for you. I didn't see any. I think I liked one of his posts. Yeah, I think I liked. <laughs> <one of his laughs> posts. Um. How have things been going? Otherwise, is golf still hard as hell? Yeah, yeah. Golf, golf's just like so volatile, you know. Like, yeah. I mean, I imagine it's it's the most the most volatile. So yeah, golf's golf's a golf's one of those sports. Like it, they talked about this on on um on Neil's podcast about I don't know if you caught it about because shit, my money's been only entering like fifty lineups or something. Yeah, I heard that. Yeah, and um, and and it, he also said his like biggest swing was a hundred thousand dollars, and I was like, oh my god, that's it! <laughs> like, I wish, I wish that was my biggest swing ever. Um, which which actually makes me think that he's he's doing something right. Um, and maybe part of that is dump, dumping down from one hundred fifty to fifty. My thought on that was. It makes a a lot of sense to me, and maybe somebody can argue and tell me why I'm wrong. But to do that in um, uh, uh, du duping sports, showdowns, MMA, stuff like that, because like the way I advocate playing is, you no, know, you try not to dupe much, but by doing that, you're really putting in some long shot lineups. You don't want dead lineups. Well, you want like the it just inherently they're gonna be they're gonna win less frequently. But when you do, you'll be up there by yourself preferably maybe with like less than five guys. So it makes sense bankroll wise to, in those, in those uh, ones to, to go down. Uh, if, you know, if you, you know, I mean, you could still go 150 if you, if you, if your ROI is showing positive and you have the bankroll to hold it, but it makes a lot of sense in those. But in the other sports, it doesn't make as much sense to me except PGA too just because it's so um, volatile, like I was saying before, that I yeah. think that kind of makes some sense to to protect your bankroll to stop doing 150 in PGA. NBA and MLB, I'd probably say no. Um, and then NFL, like whatever. <laughs> whatever with NFL. NFL. NFL, like you're going to have an edge just because there's so many – so many extra players because it's so popular. Yeah. So like your ROI is going to show big enough where you probably should just still do 150. But if you're playing large fields, like just don't expect to win, you know, very, free, very often. Yep. Yeah. The, uh, that have you, have you, uh, like, uh, for any of the late swap, have you figured out how much time you're actually saving? Like on a slate, like late swap versus no late swap, how much that's buying back for you? It's it's less this year because of the short slate. But yeah, it's it's even with the short slate, it's saving you two hours, um, and three with the long slate. Also, like it's annoying. Like you don't you don't want to take a shower. You know you don't want to be too far from your computer. You know things things can happen. So it's to be fair, uh, Brian. a lot less stressful. To be fair, people don't expect DFS pros to take showers. They they expect you to be grinding it out, showering once a week. Well, I'm your man, then people. You, <laughs> you found your you found your work. shady shady here. I agree with you. Yeah, like I'm not saying it's better for. <laughs> I'm not saying it's better by you know any means, especially with the tools we have uh, available. Of which shady is always like the number one ROI in uh, Saber Sims post lock Sims. Um, maybe he drops to two or three on a bad day. Oh, wow. Dropping to two or three shady. Be better, man. Be better. Mm -hmm. Um, 
we were going to talk a little best ball. I had some thoughts I wanted to uh, piggyback on Brian and Davis's conversation last week. I found a lot of it very interesting. And instead of bringing it up here, I was like, you know what? I'm going to give Brian his prediction that I'm going to make a video about this. And I was like, let's just speed this up. So I am in the lab making a video about scroll the F down. I did want to kind of make one uh, to, you know, talking about some of it from like the daily perspective, but I think it gets really interesting per your guys' discussion on how it could be applied to season long best ball. So um, I, I think you guys are, are firmly on the right track. I have a few kind of little suggestions, tags onto it. So okay. I'll probably hopefully have that video out by next week. And then maybe we can talk about it a little bit more on next week's lulls. Perfect. Yeah. And I'm putting all that stuff on the app, hopefully by that next show too. So we, maybe we can show it in action too. Yeah. By, yeah. If you guys don't know what, Brian's talking about too, by the way, if you go to brick75.com, uh, sign in, you just need your free sign in on the NFL tab. You can go look through the 150 maxers. That's how, uh, Brian was able to figure out that Davis was a massive knit and how Jack was the king of CLV. It is hilarious. Uh, just all the, the different profiling from just our, uh, circle uh, of the internet. With yeah. The, with the I, draft. I, I, my hope is you'll be able to do it like Boca Tracker. Right. That was kind of the hope from the beginning. Yeah. And you'll be able to like you got your pick coming up and you go look at their stats and through experience, you'll be able to be like, I, I have to take this guy now because I know for sure this knit is going to be following ADP uh, and, you know, whatever. Pat Mahomes is next. So I got to take him to f- complete my stack now. I can't wait. Stuff like that. It's uh, it's funny too because there's there's a guy, a, a user, and I don't even know him off the top of my head, but he's already become infamous in the the Discord. People screenshot him. He just loves to to go like bully quarterback, and he's like a red badge guy, so it's not just like someone autoing or whatever taking four or five quarterbacks. And everyone now is hip to that, and they are getting more aggressive on quarterbacks in drafts specifically with him, just knowing this guy's going to start ripping quarterbacks. There at a certain go. point. So like there yeah. is, there is value to, to some of that profile. That'll be on there. Yeah. I also want to talk about, you know, we'll talk about next week though. Like I'm going to put like the average one fifty or like what they do, but we're still at the infancy of best ball strategy still, you know, it's we're still definitely so more early, so early, but it's, but I mean, but not really that early, right? Because they're, the strategies are pretty strong, I would say. And so, um, you know, but just like a baseline, because like back in poker, uh, who knows what it is now, but in, in the dinosaur days, you know, like a VPIP of like 22% with a three bet of like, I don't know, 12% or four, 14% was kind of like your average rate. Hey God, speaking of uh, insider terminology, uh, explain vpip because uh, you can't just toss that around and assume people are going to know it. <laughs> i figure we only have like a minute left uh, yeah no, 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 put in the pot percentage so the yeah. amount of times you voluntarily put money into the pot um uh, pre-flop yeah um, and it's a metric that kind of gauges like how splashy how aggressive are you or are you a total net so like a reg who's in like the 30 percent range six and a six max aim six players um <laughs> uh would be like you're gonna you're gonna see a wider range from from that guy and, a, and like a nitty rag would be like 14 8 or something like that back then yeah um anyway i now i don't remember my point what was i saying <laughs> uh you were gonna put get some of this up on the site and it's like you can now go look at davis's stats and when you're in a draft with him you know you don't need to reach around and a half to grab this guy because davis is just taking the guy at the top of the key. yeah I, I i had a point i lost it oh. but but like to your bully bully uh a QB guy, yeah, like that'll be on there. So, like, what was the average round that he took his first QB? Yeah, and then cool. oh, that was it. The 150 reg, uh, the 150, um, the 150 years average. So, like, what we need is to get like a consensus baseline for what a reg is. So, like, a reg's like standard deviation is it is it 11? Is it is it more what Pete's doing, or is it more yeah. like eight, eight, eight and a half? And then and then you and then some you know, bro rolls in and he's got a standard deviation of 25. You got to be like, okay, well, I got to expect some crazy shit with this guy. You know, he's not, he's not going to be your, your tight rag. Yeah. I, I guess it, there, there are equivalents, right. Where you have, you know, 150 maxers who are very tight. I mean, you can look at your data and then you have some who are way more aggressive. So it's like hard to profile as like a single cohort because people have different styles, even as high volume players. 
Th they cert they certainly do. Yeah. But yeah. um, but like you could kind of expect a certain style that were like you know, obviously it's not apples and apples, you know, poker and, and best ball. But um you need you need to compare. I mean, obviously it has to compare to something or it doesn't matter, right? Like if you have nothing to compare it to, what does it matter what the number is? So like the there'll yeah. be and it's just math. Right. The standard deviation, the larger it is, the more wide the guy is going to be. And like the lower his QB first drafted QB is. So like if his his first pick of his QB is like 20, like you can expect this guy's taking a QB in the first or second or third round almost every time. Yeah. there. I also wonder if there's like some granular like to give you an example. I actually think um I was maybe closer to Davis than I was to Pat, but I also, you know, I would draft with uh, like Sean Siegel on Wednesdays and there'd be like, Sean is very player specific and he'd just be like, okay, we're, you know, we're taking Curtis Samuel four rounds ahead of ADP or we're taking Marvin Mims or Tyquan Thornton, like eight rounds. So I think like on the whole, but I probably had a few outliers and that would be another interesting thing. Like, is this guy throwing ADP out the window or does he just have a small cohort of guys that he's willing to continually take way ahead of ADP? Your, so your value hound ratio was 0. 0.44. This was kind of interesting. I thought, and Davis's was 0. 0.39. So even though you were much looser ADP wise, you were more likely to take someone above uh, or like, Past their ADP, whatever you want to say, whatever the value yeah. version of that is, which is kind of interesting. So that means that like you so, and you can also like decipher from the very from two numbers, you know, one thing. So like that means Davis is going to stay tight to his range of ADP, but it's usually going to be after, not before. Right. So like like if he's going to have. um you know, like if, if, if there's like, you know, three guys on the board who clearly haven't been picked yet, they're way past ADP. He might not take them. He still might take someone, you know, f three or four or five spots after ADP. So 0.75, I, I just pulled it up here. This is brick75.com. The value hound ratio 0.75 was the highest here. User the, dim sum. What I think these guys did since Jack is in there is they all auto drafted. Yes. So it'd be nice to know who auto drafted to remove them from the averages. Well, I, we I don't think fantasy. I don't think fantasy flock uh, auto drafted. Well, his and, teams. It, but like, look at his standard deviation. He's like one of the neediest, yeah, players out there. So like, he's gonna have value. Like he's yes. if he if if there was somebody there, he's taking them. Yeah, there. This is um, Pepper Prince is uh, Dan Zach Poker Bro. Um. Your yours and Pat's numbers were like really similar. Yeah. And I mean, Pat drafted, uh, I drafted probably, I don't know, 25 of my teams with Pat. And I think Pat and I obviously have similar styles as well. I used his uh rankings for a lot of my early drafts. So there's definitely reasons uh why that would be here. So here I am. Do you have anything where you can query or search on this? No, but you can okay. copy it and put it in Excel. Yeah, yeah. If there's a copy button or a download button. Um, yeah. I would have to pay <laughs> to get that changed. Yeah. It is kind of amazing, though, to see the standard deviation difference from, like, guys in the five range to guys in the 30 range. Yeah. So, like, they're on average 30 different spots. It's pretty crazy. That is. Yeah. And it, like, it would be fun. There's no way to get that information. It would be fun. Well, well, actually, would there be to get like what there? And again, I know it's only one fucking slate, but, you know, overall advance rate, uh, ROI on the contest, like, and then be able to see if there was any corollaries with style of play and return on investment. What we get yeah, when we get more slates. Yeah, we need more. Yeah, we need more slates. And then that's another issue. We'll have to look at like, do we want to combine battle royale numbers? I don't know. Yeah, probably not. I think total drafts you do. It'd be because it'd be nice to know that you know sacrilegious has 894 drafts, you know, compare you know, like a player who's got a ton of drafts, so you just didn't recognize the name. And you're yeah. like, this is this is a badge, bro. This is a regular. Yeah. Because you know, he's just playing all and maybe they only did 50 entries in the BBM three for some reason, you know. Right. Um, all right, Brian. 
yeah. good getting back in the saddle. We'll be back next week, 1.30 p.m. Eastern. We get these uh, audio files up on the Lulz podcast feed for you audio listeners. Make sure you're subscribed to this channel. Also, if you guys want to check out the fake Lulz podcast from last week, you can check that out on Brian's YouTube channel. He also has been posting a couple uh, shows that he's done with Davis over there. Anything else, Brian? That, I think that's it. All right, guys. Uh, thanks for chilling. Uh, I don't have any more shows this week. Uh, Saturday night, uh, DFS After Dark is is doing its soft rebrand flip back to Best Ball After Dark, having uh, JJ Zacharyson, aka the late round quarterback, on. So if you guys are YouTube members, you get access to those. I saw uh, JGFC shouting out the show with shady advice I did a few weeks back. Um, if you become a YouTube member, you get access to that entire set of archives. I've done has to be uh, nearing 50 of those premium shows, all evergreen, not really slate specific stuff. So if you guys want to become a YouTube member, support the channel, you'll get access to those and the show with JJ this weekend. For Brian, I'm Pete. We'll see you guys next time on Lowell's.